Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. With you. Let us pray. Keep, O Lord, we beseech thee, thy household, the church, in thy steadfast faith and love, that by the help of thy grace we may proclaim thy truth with boldness and minister thy justice with compassion. For the sake of our Savior Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the lesson. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. Since we're justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The word of the Lord.
like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. The Gospel of the Lord. Jesus, Savior, may I know your love and make it known. Amen. Please be seated. I'm going to take a drink of water because it's been a scorcher of a weekend. And apparently triple-digit temperatures await us uh, today and tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. And on a morning like this, uh, when I'm standing outside in the summer and shaking hands with folks after the service, it's, it's not all that unusual for a couple of folks to they stare at my face and they squint their eyes and they say something like, I can tell where you've been. Uh, you didn't put on enough sunscreen when you went to the beach. And then I turn my head slightly and say, well, I, I wish I'd been at the beach, but um, I've mostly been staying inside. I have rosacea, so my face often lights up with redness and sometimes just like a Christmas ornament. And once in a blue moon, uh, someone walks away as if they're still a little unconvinced. <laughs> now, while it's true that my face would have been more red had I gone to the beach, the underlying condition means that it won't completely go away with better choices. Okay? And that's a good way to think about the different ways that people sometimes think about sin. Sin means whatever pushes you away from God, from other people, even from your true self. It widens the gap between you and the rest of creation and the God of creation. But let me ask you a question. Is sin a list of bad choices or is it a condition? Well, it can be both, okay? Making fewer bad choices, however, won't take away the condition, which is simply the problem of being human equally distributed. That is to say that we live uh, imperfectly. Uh, we make mistakes. Uh, that we sometimes hurt other people and ourselves. That we're often walking away from God rather than toward God. The theologian and writer Frederick Buechner, who died just this past summer, uh, he once said, the power of sin is centrifugal. When at work in a human life, it tends to push everything out toward the periphery. Bits and pieces go flying off until only the core is left. Eventually, bits and pieces of the core itself go flying off until in the end, nothing at all is left. The 
wages of sin is death is St. Paul's way of saying the same thing. St. Paul, who famously went from persecuting the followers of Jesus to joining them, wrote those words about the connection between sin and death in his letter to Christians in Rome. Well, actually, he dictated that letter, the same letter from which we read this morning and will continue to read throughout the rest of the summer. Paul dictated it to a man named Tertius, who identifies himself as the scribe at the end of the letter, and greets in the name of the Lord the Christians who will hear it read. So I, I like to think of Tertius as having been greeting Christians from one generation right up to this very moment. And who exactly is taking this letter to those Christians in Rome and reading it to them? Well, that would be Phoebe, a woman also introduced at the end of the letter and called both a deacon in the church and a patron, a financial supporter of Paul's ministry. It is Phoebe who would have discussed this letter with Paul before taking it to Rome and then becoming uh, its first interpreter. So if people had questions about the letter, they would have had a conversation with Phoebe. So the words we heard this morning from the fifth chapter of Romans were first read in a church by Phoebe. She told them about the peace we have through Christ, the grace in which we stand because of Christ, and the love that's been poured into our hearts since Christ died for us, the ungodly, while we were still sinners. New Testament scholar Beverly Gaventa, whom I actually interviewed uh, about Phoebe and all the other women named in Romans as part of our Great Wednesday webinar series, she imagines Christians in Rome being a little puzzled by some of this language, thinking, who are you calling sinner, lady? That's how she puts it in her book. That's how she imagines people at least thinking as they're hearing Phoebe talk. Those Christians in Rome were either Jewish and thus already part of God's people, or they were the sort of Gentiles, outsiders, who hung out with God's people. That is to say, they probably had a strong sense of moral conviction conveyed through teaching in the synagogue. Those Christians in Rome were like many of us, or at least some of us. But Paul is concerned about more than a list of bad choices that we make or that others make. Paul is concerned about more than forgetting to put on sunscreen at the beach. He's concerned about the underlying condition, which remains even when you use all of the sunscreen with all of the protections recommended by the federal government. Paul, in this letter, will go on to speak about sin and death as if they are powers, akin to villains in a superhero movie. We can see their effects when we read the news, when we see images of modern warfare, when we learn about the history of slavery, when bridges between friends and family are burned to the ground, when we grieve the death of someone we love. These kinds of things affect us and hurt us even when they're not directly caused by us. And there are lots of things that bind us. They bind us and define the limitations within which we live. The cross of Christ has defeated these powers and set us free from them. And that means we can live in hope, even when the facts on the ground do not bear witness to hope, because God will have the last word and nothing will be able to separate us from God's love in Christ. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, as Paul so beautifully puts it in the 8th chapter of Romans, words that we frequently uh, read at funerals right here. Those words bring great comfort when we gather here for the funeral of someone we've known as a friend, someone we've loved as a spouse, someone we've knelt beside at the communion rail as a fellow Christian. But you don't have to wait until a funeral for those words to mean something. Because they mean something today. They mean something this morning. They mean something right now. And the truth they speak will still be true as we walk through these doors onto Main Street in this fourth largest city in America. 
there is nothing that will be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. When I think about that, how wonderful it is, and the realities faced by every human being, another quote of Frederick Buechner frequently comes to mind, and I think probably a lot of you have heard this before. But he once wrote, The grace of God means something like, Here is your life. You might never have been, but you are because the party wouldn't have been complete without you. Here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. I am with you. Nothing can ever separate us. It's for you I created the universe. I love you. And I love that quote. Christ has done something, something not against us, but for us. Christ loved humanity to the end, even when humanity was squeezing the life out of a tortured and broken body on the cross. But humanity could not extinguish that love or keep it in a tomb. In our reading this morning, Paul refers to this grace in which we stand. We stand in this grace at the beginning of our liturgy when we acknowledge that no secrets are hidden from the God to whom all hearts are open. We stand in this grace in the middle of this liturgy when we have heard that we are forgiven, truly forgiven, and share with one another the peace we have received in Christ. We stand in this grace at the end of the liturgy, having been fed with holy food at the Lord's table and having been blessed and sent into the world from that table as we process together out of these doors and into the world with its beauty and its terror. But fear not. The Christ who loved humanity to the end was raised from the dead and loves humanity, loves us, loves you, loves me, now. And that's a condition which none of our choices, not even our worst ones, not even a 1970s-era choice of copper-toned sun-tanning oil to, quote, own the sun, can ever take away. Nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ. This I believe. Amen. Rising in spirit or in body, let us affirm the faith of the church with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God. Prayers of the people. Whoops. Let us pray for the church 
and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess thy name may be united in the truth, live together in thy love, and reveal thy glory in the world. Lord, in thy mercy, guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, especially Joe, President of the United States, Greg, Governor of Texas, Sylvester, Mayor of Houston, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in thy mercy, give us all a reverence for the earth as thy own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to thy honor and glory. Lord, in thy mercy, bless all those whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in thy mercy, comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, and spirit, especially patients and those who care for them across the street in the Texas Medical Center. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them joy in thy salvation. Lord, in thy mercy, we commend to thy mercy all who have died, and that thy will for them may be fulfilled. We pray that we may share with all thy saints in thy eternal kingdom. Lord, in thy mercy, O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of thy people and the multitude of thy mercies. Look with compassion upon us and all who turn to thee for help, for thou art gracious, O lover of souls. And to thee we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Most merciful God, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath prophesied for all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand for the peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us offer one another a sign of Christ's peace. Please be seated and welcome this morning to the second Eucharist of the Lord's Day here at Palmer Memorial Episcopal Church. And a special greeting to those who may be guests with us, perhaps for the first time. 
Uh, there's information right in the front of your uh, cert the bulletin uh, about welcome cards and about receiving communion or a blessing. Uh, and also how to ask someone to pray for you before you leave the, the doors of the church today, if that would be if that would be helpful to you. And we'd love to talk to you as well as you're heading out. I know it's going to be hot today, uh, but if you if we can talk a little bit uh, as you're leaving the doors of the church today, you'll also see that there's a bake sale that's happening uh, related to the Adventure Learning Program, which you can read about right on the front page of the Palmer insert. The announcement says they're going to be in the breezeway, which they were before the service, but they're actually going to be uh, out in, uh, in front of the front doors of the church as you leave. Uh, so know about that. Next Sunday, uh, a lot of things are happening. We're going to continue our uh, adult formation series on Back to Basics. That takes place at the, during the 9 o'clock hour in the conference room that's right by the church offices, right across the hall from the chapel. Uh, so please come to that uh, if you're interested in that. We're also going to have our next uh, parish picnic after this 10 o'clock service. So we're going to do that. At the, this is the, will be the last Sunday in June. We're going to do it uh, the last Sunday in July. Uh, and then we're going to have uh, kind of a, a, fest, a feast together the last Sunday in August. So this is an opportunity uh, both to worship together, but also, uh, but also to share a meal with one another, get to know each other a little bit better over the summer. So that is taking place um, as well. Uh, as you would have read in my email uh, to the church on Friday, just remember that the church offices are closed on Monday in observance of Juneteenth. Also, look in that email about there's a, there's a public lecture that's taking place on Tuesday night across the street at Rice University. Uh, Annette Gordon-Reed, Reed, who is a professor at Harvard University, but from this area, will be giving a lecture on Juneteenth, and some of you will remember that I interviewed her uh, about Juneteenth uh, last year uh, as part of our Great Wednesday webinar series, but you can go hear her in person on Tuesday night, so go back to that email for those details. There is also something important happening between today and next Sunday. I want to ask Ryan Hawthorne, our curate, to tell us about that. Good morning, everyone. Uh, next Saturday is the annual Houston Pride Parade, and Palmer will be walking in that parade along with other affirming congregations in this uh, diocese in the, air, in the Houston area. And so some of you have signed up with me to walk, and if you haven't but you're still interested in walking, please email me so I can get you the sign-up page and get you the information. Uh, and some of you have also signed up to help build the float. We will be building the float at Trinity Episcopal Church because it has uh, easier access to the parade route. And we'll start building the float on Saturday morning at 8 a.m. And so um, if you're, sorry, at 9 a.m. So if you um, are interested in that, please email myself or Roger Hutchinson to get more information. Also, we have pride shirts for you to purchase whether or not you're going to walk in the pride parade. The theme this year for the Episcopal churches or the Episcopal presence at Pride is queerly beloved. Uh, and so if you'd like to show your pride next Sunday, uh, I invite you to purchase a shirt from us uh, between Tuesday and Friday in the church office. They just came in this week, but Roger and I have been out. And so we have the shirts, but we need to inventory them before we start selling them. So we know what we exactly what we have, uh, because we have to make sure that walkers have shirts. And so if you are interested in the shirt, please email me today so that I can start pulling shirts for people. And then if you'll stop by the office between Tuesday afternoon and Friday, or meet us at the parade route on Saturday if you're walking with us and we will have shirts for you. Uh, and you can always buy one on campus next Sunday as you're walking into church. Thank you. Thank you. Let us with gladness present the offerings and oblations of our life and labor to the Lord.
and with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is meet and right so to do. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee. O Lord, Holy Father, almighty, everlasting God, creator of the light and source of life, who has made us in thine image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, to thee, O Lord our God, for that thou didst create heaven and earth, and didst make us in thine own image, and of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to take our nature upon him, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. He made there a full and perfect sacrifice for the whole world, and did institute, and in his holy gospel command us to continue, a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice, until his coming again. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks to thee, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, we thy people do celebrate and make with these thy holy gifts which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming again with power and great glory, and we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and with thy word and Holy Spirit to bless and sanctify these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be unto us the body and blood of thy dearly beloved Son, Jesus Christ. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, whereby we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, Grant, we beseech thee, that all who partake of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, and also that we and all thy whole church may be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us, and we in him, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. By whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come.
the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, May the blessing of the God of Abraham and Sarah, and of Jesus Christ, born of our sister Mary, and of the Holy Spirit, who broods over the world as a mother over her children, be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.